down, we can get started. Welcome to the Business Finland's webinar series on situational awareness. Business Finland is the Finnish government's innovation funding arm. Our role is to ensure the Finnish economy is thriving with innovative research and businesses that reach beyond the borders of our small country. One vehicle we use to achieve that goal are publicly funded programs and the new space economy program, the umbrella for today's topic is a recent example. The new space economy program is building a situational awareness offering. We can call it a platform, we can call it an architecture that comprises of Finnish and international research and business partners. The purpose of this webinar series is to reach out to North American public and private partners in order to see if there are opportunities for further negotiations. My name is Petra Söderling. I work for Business Finland and I'm stationed in the US to help facilitate these talks. In case you're wondering about the background, I'm calling in today from the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Uh, earlier in this series, we laid out the current Finnish situational awareness platform and looked at use cases in forestry. Today, we have two very advanced companies presenting how situational awareness can be used in the maritime industry. Before we get to the day's agenda, a couple of house rules. First, you're all muted but you will be able to ask questions via the Q&A chat in your GoToWebinar platform. You can ask your question anonymously or you can put your name and company there. At the end of the two presentations, I will be reading out your questions to the panelists, but I will not read out your name and company. That information will remain with us in case you want us to contact you for further information. Without further ado, let's get down to uh, today's agenda. Uh, our first speaker is Mr. Pekka Laurila. He is the Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder at ISI. Pekka, if um, you want to turn on your video so we can see what you look like, I'm also going to make you a presenter. So Pekka is the Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder of I ISI. And as the CSO, Mr. Laurila has been instrumental in establishing and directing the company's strategy, and previously as a CFO, raising the initial funds for ISI. Pekka Laurila is a co-creator of the Synthetic Aperture Radar, SAR microsatellites, to solve various large-scale issues the world faces. He brings with him deep domain expertise in geographic information systems, and he has received the 2018 Forbes 30 Under 30 Technology Award based on the world first achievements of ISI. Prior to co-founding co ISI, Mr. Laurila play, played an instrumental role in Finland's Aalto University nano satellite program, the Aalto One, where he studied as a student of engineering and geo-information systems program He's also published several, several papers on these topics. So please go ahead, Pekka, and start your presentation. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so good day, from, good, good, good day from my side. Good evening from Finland. Um, my name is Pekka Arla, and, uh, and indeed uh, here to talk about what ISAI can bring to the table in terms of maritime situational awareness um, and uh, maybe a few words about the, the company itself. We take the um, new space economy program quite literally. We literally design, build and operate spacecraft satellites uh, that uh, we, we, we uh, design ourselves uh, in, in, in the and, and then then also build and uh, and also operate um, in a constellation, you know, to create services uh, in a variety of use cases. And then today we'll talk specifically about about the the maritime use case. And uh, the company roughly in numbers, um, we are a uh, 
a uh, 2015 founded company right now uh, a sort of series c uh, venture backed um, company so at the stage of, of over 100 million dollars in uh, secured financing and uh, roughly 200 people uh, you know worldwide experts in, in in the domain that we're working with so we built the uh, a world leading team specifically in the area of of, of uh, radar imaging satellites um, and uh, specifically in uh, miniaturized radar imaging satellites um, and uh, and we currently operate in um, in, uh, in 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 uh, four countries uh, we're headquartered headquartered here in Finland and uh, and then we have an office in Poland US and UK um, we've established already a fair bit of a portfolio of international customers with our first satellites and first services and uh, and then we're we're definitely growing growing that um, so when I say radar imaging satellites the the idea is to create a capability to image reliably uh, in, in all conditions and uh, and in all conditions means all times of day and all weather conditions uh, something that you can imagine if you're imaging with an optical camera you're going to be restricted with the nighttime uh, because you don't have the daylight to image and you're going to be restri restricted through, uh, with, with clouds because you can't see through them with radar imaging you can do both uh, it's an active instrument you transmit the energy and you're measuring the reflected signal uh, so uh, the daylight is not necessary and the the uh, wavelengths that we are using also penetrate clouds so you can create this layer of information where you can image in in any condition and it's obviously very important for for um, uh, any situation where you're working with uh, needs for for uh, real-time situational awareness that the source of information is always reliable and uh, we're talking about maritime so what is uh, radar imaging of a you know maritime scene look like i picked this off uh, you know just out of a a recent coverage uh just um off the coast of new york um and uh what you can see there is a single um we call it a strip map image uh where the resolution is roughly three meters on ground per pixel and you can see individual items like ships and then the wakes that the ships are leaving to the to the sea you can see the coastline you can see the cities and also very importantly you can see the sea surface itself so so you can see the the waves on the sea surface uh the the uh, sort of wind sea state um and the patterns that it creates on, on on the sea surface so uh when you're typically thinking about radar you might be thinking about things that that, that you know they are sort of blips on a screen but but actually everything in the world reflects radar waves so so when we are using the the radar imaging technology uh, it's called a synthetic aperture radar we can form an image of you know any sort of man-made or or any natural targets at fairly high resolutions uh, currently our our best resolutions reach to 25 centimeters on on, on the ground and then really uh, the image does look black and white in a way the the measured parameter is the sort of backscatter reflectance meaning that, that we get a single channel only but but the the the, the important trade-off is, is that we can get this image at any condition at any time of day and, and, and in any weather so it's very very well suited for for situational awareness and um, radar satellite uh, imagery you know has existed before so why we decided to do uh, let's say our own design and an own, own build, our own factory around building uh, new satellites, and uh, it's um, uh, it's mostly related to sort of economics of scale. So, uh, in order to let's say execute on the vision that we have to really bring uh, the the reliable information available in real time, uh, you need very large numbers of satellites. So. So uh, with a single satellite, you can only be in a one place at one time. And that typically means that if you operate, uh, you know, the current governmental missions, uh, the time to access uh, any given site can be multiple days before you get the first opportunity to image. So if you're trying to track activity or react to some
Um, I th Beth, I think we might have lost your audio. Can you maybe try to mute and unmute yourself? Yeah, everyone's lost the audio. Yeah, I'm gonna try and mute Becca and on 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 mute. Did that help? Can we hear you now, Becca? No. Certainly hope so. Oh. Can you hey. hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sounds very good. Yeah, please. You should, you should be able to hear me now. Uh, yes, please, please continue. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Becca, we, we hear you now. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Please continue. Yeah, I'm, I am. I am fairly sure you should be hearing me. At least I can see the bars. Uh, Visible yes. over here. Okay. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, yeah. So, so, so it's really, really all about the amounts, and and uh, we are getting to a point where we we can produce uh, ability to image in a matter of hours anywhere on the globe. Uh, you know, when when we are talking about uh, tens of satellites on orbit, and this is something that we have really sort of created a sort of world leading technology that we can produce these units in a in produce and launch these units uh, in a sort of cost-efficient scale that is required for this type of vision. And um, something that you might have um, might have uh, seen ISA data before. Uh, this was a good example of, of of let's say importance of all of those factors combined, being able to be rapidly on site and then also see you know through nighttime and cloud coverage. So uh, when the Hurricane Dorian uh, covered uh, the, the effectively half of the island of Bahamas with, with uh, storm surge water, it was uh, the ISI satellite data was the, the, uh, the data that was um, available. Uh, basically, the first 24 hours was, uh, was, was uh, say, the, the only ISI data was, was, was the, the available coverage of, 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 of that event. And uh, we got a fairly good uh, coverage in uh, in the U.S. news media too with, with with this imagery. Ever since we've developed quite an extensive uh, insurance product coverage uh, on 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 this product. Um, but today we're talking about maritime and situational awareness over there. So so um, um, uh, how does how how does this you know work with uh, with, with ships and then seeing what's happening on the on, on the oceans? So so. Um, uh, ships reflect radio waves, and uh, and then it allows us to to uh, you know detect and classify you know ships, and uh, and also ships leave uh, wakes behind them. So this allows us to detect vessels on 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 sea uh, that might even be too small in their uh, backscatter or radar cross section to be detected otherwise. And uh, and let's say pulling all this all this together. When the the coverage is rapid and uh, and world actually has a fairly large amount of ships there, uh, then then it comes down to developing you know uh, detection mechanisms and, and and AI mechanisms for for detecting every single one of uh, those vessels uh, from, from from the imagery, um, and and then 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 on top of it um, uh, the the sort of situational awareness picture. Then it gets filled by us being able to pull AIS data, uh, so automatic identification system data, 
from uh, from other sources and then match uh, the detected vessels to the reported uh, locations of vessels. So basically, uh, the the you know one very important layer in a sort of government uh, uh, maritime picture is understanding of of, of where uh, all the vessels are, and especially where are all the vessels that are not reporting their locations, you know, through the official means, where AIS is a mandatory device in, in uh, ships uh, larger than certain size, uh, then you will still find vessels that uh, are not transmitting the locations or are maybe transmitting a false location or false class, uh, and, and then being able to, you know, have kind of imagery detections uh, and classes for all those vessels allows us to do comparisons and uh, and then you know one very typical use case for this is a um, is detecting so-called dark vessels so meaning dark vessels that are not broadcasting their AIS locations uh, that are performing uh, fishing activity uh, it's a very typical thing that happens in the world's oceans uh, uh, fishing in countries economic exclusion zones uh, when the the uh, when when the when, when they don't necessarily have permissions, or then fishing in uh, in in in, uh, in the times when the the uh, fishing is supposed to be restricted, and obviously this is very important from you know both the the uh, let's say the livelihoods of the legitimate fishers and then also the environmental point of view that like we can actually create rules that can be followed or can be monitored and enforced, um, and um, yeah, and so so the total picture uh, for maritime situational awareness that, that, that we are able to support at ISI then really comes down to being able to get down to that uh, time scale of you know hourly updates of vast sea areas with with uh, vessels detected and correlated with, uh, with with the identified locations um, and, and then on top of it when we go to the higher resolution side then let's say in the maritime domain uh, also, ports are an important uh, part of activity. So this is an example of a um, of a, a high resolution uh, radar image, you know, towards a container port. So you know, on, on the on the bottom, you can see you know identifiable and you know countable containers. So so uh, you know, seeing the sort of more full economic picture of supply and demand in in the or like let's say at least activity. Is another another piece of situational awareness for for the maritime sector, and uh, and then other things that like would not be reported necessarily in 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 real time in the beacons either would be for instance the the, the field states of, of 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 vessels or the drafts, and uh, it's something that that we are working on to to be able to detect and 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 report on a sort of let's say neutral objective uh, basis, um, and and then another thing that that is important for the maritime uh, picture is a uh, is, is uh, monitoring for oil spills in the sea surface, and this is something also where uh, radar imagery specifically is uh, is very well suited. And and now imagine being able to do this in the you know sort of you know real time time scales where where uh, you know being able to uh, guide uh, recovery operations, for instance, based on this information uh, would become would would become more realistic. Uh, so these are all the, the, the types of uh, directions where we are pushing the, the maritime uh, domain area to, to become better with the, with the capacity that we are building. And uh, yes, those uh, first satellites are flying and uh, they are operational and we are producing products for our commercial customers. So uh, you know, on our website, you can get access to, to uh, uh, sample data and, uh, and I'm very happy to, to uh, discuss more. As, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. That was hugely, hugely interesting. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to take all the questions at the end of both presentations. So our next speaker uh, will be Jussi Poikonen, and I am going to promote Jussi as a presenter. And if you also want to turn on your video, there you are. And Becca, if you can turn off your video, I will also keep my video off. I was told that my connection is poor, so uh, um, I'm a little blurry. Very well. Um, we can see you, you'll see, and we can see your presentation. Let me just uh, properly introduce you. Dr. Jussi Poikonen is the co-founder 
uh, in AI and analytics uh, company Awake.ai. He will be talking about universal information exchange for maritime logistics. Jussi Poikonen is, as I said, a doctor of science in technology, and he's a co-founder and vice president of AI and analytics at Awake.ai, where his team develops predictive an analytics, machine learning models, and optimization algorithms for the Awake.ai smart port platform. Dr. Poikonen is also an adjunct professor of microelectronics at the University of Turku in Finland. Before his current position at Awake.ai, Dr. Poikonen was an AI development lead at Rolls-Royce Marine, focusing on development of autonomous and remote controlled vessels. He has published over 80 research articles on telecommunications, emerging technologies, and neuromorphic computing. Uh, go ahead, Yossi, you can get started. Thank you, Petra. Very happy to be here today uh, talking to you about situational awareness for smart ports and maritime logistics. Um, I'd like to say a few words first about the background of Awake.ai. Petra mentioned uh, Rolls-Royce Marine, and that's kind of um, relevant uh, for situational awareness. The founders and um, core developers uh, at Awake.ai were part of uh, this um, autonomous ships development uh, uh, department at Rolls-Royce Marine. Uh, where we demonstrated some of the world's first autonomous vessels and, and this kind of state-of-the-art situational awareness systems in those. For example, this image is, is from um, the world's first fully autonomous road ferry uh, and demonstrates this kind of a very high quality sensor fusion uh, the data that we were using to get a three-dimensional situational awareness of, of the surrounding world we were fusing. A lot of camera systems, radar, high <clears throat> dis long distance radar data, positioning data, and so on. Uh, but the kind of relevance for Awake.ai is that in developing these autonomous vessels, we realized that um, while these will be a reality, a commercial reality in say five to 10 years, there is not a single port in the world today capable of really receiving and interacting with this kind of autonomous vessels and uh, more so uh, basically digitalization in ports is is overall kind of lacking so we noticed that there is a big business potential in bringing this kind of digitalization capabilities uh, globally to ports and of course in the long term uh, enabling also this kind of fully automated maritime logistics, uh, which is offered by these autonomous vessels. Now, this kind of uh, advancing the global digitalization of ports is a really big effort, of course. Uh, so we cannot do it ourselves alone. So we, with the support of Business Finland, uh, we have started building uh, this kind of smart port and ship ecosystem. Uh, consisting currently of uh, approximately 80 partners. Of course, for us, the core partners are these pilot customers where we try to have uh, multiple actors around the port logistic chain, for example, cargo owners, uh, hinterland logistic companies, uh, port authorities, terminal operators, uh, shipping companies, and so on, and form this kind of um, combination of, of, of data sharing partners who can really benefit from this uh, enhanced situation awareness in, in maritime logistics. And of course, we partner with a lot of uh, technology providers, software companies, hardware companies, and, and different kinds of ecosystems uh, to move this, this big uh, goal towards this goal. Now, what do we really mean? with situation awareness in maritime logistics. Uh, basically, we need to be aware of sea traffic, what is happening at sea. For example, here, the blue heat map shows um, historical uh, vessel traffic, this kind of a 
highways of the sea. We need to be aware of what happens in the ports, basically between uh, inbound pilotage and outbound pilotage for the vessels. Here the red dots are pilot stations, the yellow ones are Finnish ports. And of course, we need to be aware of cargo operations inside the port, um, what is happening with the, say, cargo unloading, uh, unloading where everything is in the port. And of course, we want to share information with hinterland uh, logistics, this multimodal uh, logistics, like uh, here you see the road networks uh, in white and, and uh, finished trains in, in green, green dots. And uh, finally, we want to offer this kind of port specific predictive models, uh, develop machine learning models, analytics for predicting, for example, when vessels will arrive to a port, when cargo discharge or loading will be complete, when, when the cargo will be ready for pickup at the port gate and so on. Now, technically, what this means, what, what we are developing is, is um, uh, what we call a smart port as a service platform. This means a modern cloud-based uh, platform with APIs connecting to the various participants in the port logistic chain, like ship operators, terminal operators, freight forwarders, cargo owners, and so on. And the idea here is to get um, from these parties the relevant data that helps everybody work more efficiently not to share the kind of raw data of, of, of these different companies, which may be sensitive, but basically uh, derive insight from the data and, and share what can be shared so that all the operations can be optimized. And of course, as I said, we want to do predictive analytics. So not just be aware of what is happening currently, but what will be the state of different processes in the future. So for this, uh, for example, machine learning algorithms are really important. Um, and that's one area where I'd like to focus in the rest of this presentation. So here's a few examples of the processes um, in this logistics chain that, that we need to model and predict. So uh, from the left, we kind of uh, have this vessel related predictions like destination prediction. Uh, we are monitoring all of the world's vessels and, and predicting to which ports they are, are headed for. Uh, when will they arrive in those ports? Uh, then we need to have for our customers these predictions on, on how long, for example, the cargo operations will take. And also it's very important to have capabilities of tracking uh, reliably uh, cargo within the port, which also needs this kind of, um, for example, computer vision solutions. And technically, this involves a lot of this kind of sub tasks, different sub models, and different information sources, uh, which we get from the customers and public sources, and, and like of a wide variety of, of uh, for example, APIs. Uh, as an example of this ship ETA prediction, uh, here's an image of our application from the UI level uh, where we predict the future route and arrival time of a vessel headed for Rotterdam, Netherlands. We do this kind of analysis for basically all vessels globally, uh, constantly uh, performing over 100,000 voyage predictions per day. And this is based on our machine, machine learning models uh, and which kind of use the data set but we have analyzed, let's say, over 1 million miles of, of voyage data. When we have this kind of uh, arrival time predictions, we can use them for optimizing um, various operations uh, and kind of resource utilization in the ports. So here's one case study where we have looked at uh, the operations in one port during one week. So here the x-axis is time and y-axis is uh, the distance of three ships from uh, this given port. And basically what you see here is that 
these ships um, come to anchor near the port and then they need to wait for uh, let's say for example several days for the previous ships to finish their uh, loading operations and, and leave this berth and free, freeing up, up for the next vessel. Now this demonst demonstrates our prediction model so uh, these uh, dashed lines are, are our predictions on when a ship will arrive to anchor, when they can actually go to the berth, when their loading operations will be complete and when they will uh, depart the port and uh, these models uh, demonstrated here are, are quite accurate and if we were to basically plan the vessel arrivals according to this kind of simulations we could significantly re reduce the sailing speed of these vessels and that is actually a very large potential financial and ecological benefit because um, generally slow sailing reduces the fuel consumption and, and uh, also of course cost of the sea voyage so for example in, in this case if we were, would have used uh, these simulations to support uh, planning the vessel arrivals then then there would have been significant reduction in anchorage time and sailing speed uh, this is uh, one example of the gains that we can get when we combine different prediction models in, in this kind of logistic chain optimization. Uh, uh, then one more thing I'd like to highlight is this tracking cargo in the port area, which is of course a kind of very important situa situational awareness uh, application also. Here is one example from a port where they have a lot of um, uh, imported cars. Uh, and they would like to understand how long these cars sit on this lot, uh, for example, for billing purposes and, and to understand this kind of capacity of the lot automatically so that they don't have to go and count these uh, manually. So we have implemented this kind of computer vision solution where you can, can basically detect and track uh, these cars automatically and have to, this kind of a report of, of the area. And of course, this kind of a, Modern computer, um, computer vision solutions can be applied for any kind of cargo, like uh, trailers and containers and so on. This was a really quick overview of, of the situational awareness work we do at, at ports and, and around in the surrounding logistics chain. Uh, I hope this was interesting and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Jussi. This definitely was very, very interesting. Let me grab the presenter role from you. And now I'm also going to ask uh, Pekka if you could turn on your video so I can uh, start asking questions. I'll, I'll keep my video off for bandwidth purposes. So we started receiving questions uh, during Pekka's presentation. I think most of these are to either one of, I mean, to specifically to each one of you. Uh, first question to Ice Eye, can your system tell the difference between Navy vessels and merchant ships or oil tankers? Uh, broadly speaking, answer is yes. So, so the um, oil tankers, uh, like the resolution is high enough you know, to be able to differentiate between like a bulk carrier or a oil tanker. And uh, and many Navy vessels are of course, you know, designed to be less radar reflective. Uh, and, uh, you know, they certainly do look different. Um, so, uh, so broadly speaking, answer is uh, absolutely yes. Technically, yes. But do you do that like um, proactively in your platform? Do you define the type of vessels or you just you just predict data? How does that work? Uh, I mean, right now, the thing we have done, I think we have demonstrated is, is this, uh, let's say, uh, taking the AIS data and then, you know, picking the class off of that AIS data and comparing that to the sort of apparent class of, of the vessel. Um, so basically, is it a container ship? Is it a bulk carrier? Is it a, uh, you know, like a uh, VLCC, you know, type carrier or a smaller carrier? 
um, and and uh, and and then let's say the rest of the categories, uh, you know, for now have been rather other. Uh, but 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 of course, you know, when when you are in the let's say bounds of the resolution and uh, and and then you know you're training a model, you know, then then you can train a model to 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 uh, detect uh, other classes too that that are are let's say uh, you know categorically different. Uh, so it's it, it's not that much different from from uh, you know training a uh, model uh, you know to detect uh, optical pictures if you just have enough pixels uh, to to work with uh, you you can you can train a class. Thank you. Uh, follow up question also to ISI. You said you can capture large areas of ocean on an hourly basis. How large an area can you capture? And when will it be hour hourly? Right. So, so uh, the the hourly basis uh, on a on a continuous basis uh, will need around forty satellites if we want to do that on a in 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 global scale, and um, and then that will be something that uh, you know something that we will have to very honestly see is is that like. Is there a market for going to hourly versus you know every two hours because it you know literally costs double to operate the constellation uh, to to double the capacity, uh, but but like as far as you know our, our plans to grow the constellation, we are looking at order of you know two to three years to be in those scales. So so the the, the scale where we are where we know that we will be end of next year already from the committed launches is that we will be able to access any place on the globe every four hours um, and, um, and then you know to the size of area uh, we are right now uh, say developing and deploying uh, by end of year this this uh, imaging mode that that we call scansar and uh, it allows you to uh, image a sort of swath as you're flying forward with the satellite that is a you know slightly over 100 kilometers wide uh, so it means that the, the areas you're, you're covering are, you know, hundreds by hundreds of kilometers um, uh, on a sort of, let's say, individual frame basis. And then, then as you fly forward with the satellite, then, then you keep building the coverage going forward. Okay, uh, interesting. Um, I'm going to move over um, over to you. So you presented the, the technical architecture of your port as a service platform. And you also mentioned trains there. Where do you get the data to track or identify the train network? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, it is a little bit dependent on, on basically the country. So, for example, I showed this example, which was on Finland, where the kind of public data sharing is on a very good level. We can basically get the tracking information on all trains continuously. Uh, similar information is, is available um, in many countries, for example, in Europe, but uh, this is something that perhaps cannot be guaranteed in, in all countries in the world. But of course, okay. we, we then work with uh, like uh, private parties if, if possible. So logistic companies, for example, can then share this information if they have this uh, tracking information of, of their cargo on the trains and then we can kind of use that in the platform to benefit all the parties. Yeah, so on the platform you mentioned four different players. You have ship operators, terminal operators, freight forwarders and cargo owners. Can you use these groups um, as parties to input data or are these four only the users of the data? Uh, for sure, I mean, uh, that is the idea basically to a little bit change the culture so that also parties would um, get more into the mindset that if, if they share some data, of course not the most sensitive data, but some data like time events from their systems, and we kind of uh, derive insight from, from all parties' data, then everybody can really benefit. So that, that's the way that, you know, you can make the whole logistic chain more efficient so that the port is not just the black hole where things go and come out sometime later but it's uh, more that everybody knows what is happening all the time okay that that sound, that makes um all of technical sense i wonder um, on the business model side 
you mentioned these benefits uh, for ships ETA prediction. Uh, the ships will be able to manage their speed, optimize the speed, um, the port call, optimize it. Yeah, so, so the sailing speed. Uh, and then you mentioned how long the cars sit on the lot. So you have a lot of different business interests here. Who is the party who's going to make the financial investment into this, into your system? Is it the port or could it be someone else? I think this is really not not just for one party, but it's more like a, well, basically some parties like port authorities perhaps would might pay less and and maybe offer more data. So that that's like one possible model. Uh, but of course the benefits are different for for different uh, players. Like for example, logistic companies benefit quite a lot from uh, knowing these predicted times, for example, of cargo pickup at the port gate. So that is actually really valuable for them. Whereas, for example, for the shipping companies, the benefit is different, like this just-in-time arrivals. And for the, for example, terminal operators, this the benefit may come from more efficient birth planning. So, so I mean, if we have uh, information on, on both sides of lo the logistic chain, then these uh, terminal operators can more efficiently plan their resource usage. So it's really, really different cases for different uh, uh, customers. And yeah, interesting. So you're kind of uh, innovating on the business model as well. Same yeah. question, Ice Eye. Well, there's everyone wants to know why was your um, data the first on the Dorian Storm? So you answer that, and also talk a little bit about your business model. Who's investing in your systems, and why? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So why why was our data first? Is uh, you know we we. And you know, already at that point in time, we we had a fairly large constellation. So 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 we had uh, four SR satellites uh, available for for tasking, uh, and uh, and then we were able to react to to and then track the hurricane uh, Dorian um, and and then be 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 the first on on site. Um, and um, a lot of these governmental missions they they have very strict collection plans and uh, and and then. Uh, you know, there is just a limited amount of them. So, so like eventually, uh, these areas get covered by the governmental satellites. But, but uh, in a in a case of catching the eye of a hurricane, you know, being over a very specific point on the ground, it is a matter of hours again. It's uh, it's being exactly at the right place at the, exactly the right time. And and that that's that if you want to always have that capability, you know, and you don't want to depend on luck, you know, then you have to be in all places. At, at, at the same time, and then that's what we're really going for. Um, and uh, what was the second question? Uh, just on your business model in general, mm. who is yeah. your customer? Right. Yeah. So, so um, uh, on the commercial side, I mean, like like the the two cases may be shown here. Uh, you know, the the let's say the continuation of the the uh, let's say seeing flood damage uh you know is a good example of of the sort of insurance business line that that we've we've started developing so so that that's an area where we have gone uh you know as a business model to the sort of solutions type business meaning that that um we do a very vertically integrated solution where we as operator of the constellation can guarantee the availability uh, off of that data when something happens uh, to a large um, enterprise, uh, you know, either large, you know, primary or or, or reinsurer, and uh, and then be able to produce that situational awareness, you know, exactly at the moment when it's when when it's uh, most needed, uh, and then that has a you know just a very direct commercial value of being able to to uh, let's say guide resourcing and then also just close claims earlier and uh, and when you close claims earlier. They actually cost less. Uh, there's a pretty direct relation between how early you close a claim and how much it costs you. Uh, and you know, you're talking about savings of, of, you know, sometimes it's savings of of, of hundreds of millions in an individual uh, large urban flooding event. Um, and saving uh, as well. I mean, say, say saving of lives uh, as, as as well. Obviously, like in a way that the, if you're able to monitor the situation in real time and actually react. Um, then, 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 and you know, see the big picture. Then, 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 this allows you to guide the sort of recovery activities uh, quite effectively. We are maybe not 
necessarily yet exactly just there. Uh, it will take uh, you know the, the next year's launches for us to be able to uh, you know really kind of guide a recovery operation uh, you know in in real time. But certainly it's a, it's a it's a topic that that we're we're certainly uh, let's say uh, chasing very actively. And and then on the governmental side, you know the, the maritime like. I think one of the very clear um, use cases where it's it's sort of harder to chase the commercial value of preventing illegal fishing. In a way, there is you know not a single company you know who has a commercial interest in preventing illegal fishing. But then it's obviously a very important thing for a government to be able to uh, let's say actually enforce the regulation that that they would have placed on the EDC fishing rules um, and then if there are seasons and uh, and and then the the fish stock uh, so this is this is something that that like uh, working together with governments to provide this this situational awareness uh, source data um, for for the governmental you know whether it's a usually it's a coast guard uh, in 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 the country then uh, this would be this would be an example of a of a sort of more governmental use case and, and then the business model here is of course uh, let's say it's less based on the the, the value uh, in, in a commercial sense but it is based on you know to some extent uh the 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 need and then to some extent the replacement cost that like in the in the end state we're you know trying to build a system that effectively replaces potentially all need for let's say blanket aircraft monitoring uh, and you know the operations for for that type of monitoring in a developed country with large sea areas can be you know, again, hundreds of millions per year, um, uh, you know, for operating aircraft for the sort of broad area monitoring. Then, of course, uh, what we are not intending to replace is the, let's say, the sort of spot, uh, you know, guided identification of, 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 of this of, of this illegal activity. So the idea is that when you have a fleet of aircraft, then if you can have this uh, situational awareness of these vast areas, then what you can do is that then you can have a fleet that only acts, uh, you know, with guidance, meaning, meaning that like, you know, you can directly fly to the suspected activity and, and, and use the resource much more effectively and catch uh, more of the potential offenders. Wow, uh, thank you, Pekka. Uh, still one follow-up question to you before um, giving the final word to Awake.ai as well. So if I understood correctly, um, I saw you have perfected the accuracy. You're down to 20 centimeters. You are growing your um, your coverage surface on expanding on the constellation, and you're working on the speed. Is is your idea to re always remain as the operator? And now you're looking for customers and business partners. Are you looking for research partners in uh, you know in building the coverage and um, uh, perfecting the speed as well? yeah so so we are we are very much aiming to be a a sort of a let's say almost like an infrastructure level operator in in in, in the big picture of things so so uh um what we are trying to build uh uh is is exactly the capability to uh let's say plug in uh real-time information to you know almost any use case in 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 the sort of like you know properly large picture um, and, and then this means that that like where we would be looking for partners and then where we are happy to collaborate is you know very much kind of through the value chain uh, that, that that we are researching and designing you know better radar instrumentation uh, you know through to better spacecraft you know and and then automation of operations you know processing of radar data uh, then you know detection methods of of of, of, of different object segments change interferometric um uh, sort of like the sort of type of millimeter level change that you can get from uh get, get, get from radar imagery and um and, and then obviously customers uh so so uh you know now some of the the uh, let's say services that we are doing are maybe more in a uh, piloting phase and some of them are are more in operational phase and uh and in in both of those though those phases you know the sort of customer interaction you know is obviously extremely extremely important um so so um working with a you know both the governmental and, and, and commercial customers uh uh you know is is, is very important to us and and then certainly certainly would be happy to so maybe this is a fairly broad answer but but like uh 
you know, we are a very vertically integrated company and then there's a lot of opportunities to collaborate basically throughout that entire value chain. No, that's great. We have a broad audience today on the line, so I think that was perfect. Okay, in our final minutes, I want to move on to awake.ai, a couple of more questions. First, um, you see, you showed the ecosystem slide where you had a lot of different players from different verticals. Is there anyone um, missing specifically uh, that you would like to you know, talk to in North America, either from the business side or from the public side? Well, of course, additional customers, pilot customers are always welcome. Uh, of course, there is a lot of really good research being done in the States. And I think that that's interesting for us as a AI development, machine learning development company. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, potential there in the sense also that we have really good kind of global data sets for, for developing models for this kind of things that I was discussing. And I think that the third thing would be that we are kind of interested to provide this platform also for kind of third parties to provide new services to digital ports. So that's something we would be interested to discuss. For example, software companies might use this to, to innovate and, and bring something to the marine logistics chain. Yeah, that was actually going to be, you answered my second question, which was on your product specifically. Uh, you know, you have all these um, players that I already mentioned, the ship operators, terminals, freight forwarders, and then the cargo owners, the owners of the cars on that parking lot. But in addition, so would you also want to, obviously you want to get customers that would take the entire platform, but you want to work with these individual players to perfect the platform if I understood correctly. Yeah, for sure. And, and of course, we can be really flexible in that. Uh, if some customer doesn't need the whole platform, we can, for example, provide some APIs just for their, their use. So, uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that the digital, the software partners that already work with ports would be ideal partners for you. Yeah, or or even new kind of companies who are not in the marine domain, we can kind of also provide this kind of entry to provide new services. Ah, okay. So expanding into new new industries. Very interesting. Great. We are over our well over our 45 minute time limit. This was a really fascinating conversation. Thank you very much uh, to our both speakers. And thank you everyone who uh, attended the webinar. As I mentioned, everything has been recorded and we will make the recording available to you. Thank you so much for your time today and everyone have a good day and good evening wherever you are. Thanks. Thank you.